The anime begins with our ugly, disgusting boy Haruka, the so-called protagonist. He sets a trap for some goblins chasing him, reflecting on how he's now making his way in a new world. However, he wishes to return to the moment when he was first transported so he can explain what happened. It started during lunch while he was reading alone, as usual. Haruka had a solitary life, both in the real world and in school, preferring to avoid classmates to focus on his books. If he had to categorize his class, he'd separate them into delinquents, athletes, geeks, and a few others. He himself didn't belong to any group. Suddenly, a magic circle formed on the floor, growing larger. The class panicked, but Haruka took a moment to realize what was happening. Once he noticed the magic circle, similar to the ones in the light novels he read, he got excited for a second. However, he quickly realized it could be more trouble than it was worth and tried to leave the classroom. Despite his efforts, the doors wouldn't open. Desperate, he even tried climbing to the roof, but the magic circle appeared again and swallowed him. Haruka then found himself in a white room, expecting to meet a king or beautiful princess, like in the stories, but instead, there was an old man who revealed himself to be the god of that world. It turned out that the rest of Haruka's class had already been transported, and he was the last one to arrive, likely because the god overlooked his attempt to escape. The god hurried him to set his stats, as each person gets 50 points to allocate towards skills like magic. However, since Haruka was last, all the good skills were taken, leaving him with weaker options. Despite this, he decided to make the best of it. He initially rolled low on his stats and wasn't happy, but when he checked again, his luck stat had maxed out. Now fully in the new world, Haruka assessed his situation. His special bag, which could hold infinite items, contained mostly useless stuff. After exploring the forest, he struggled to see in the dark, but remembered his contact lenses skill, which gave him the ability to see clearly and evaluate objects. This helped him find edible mushrooms and other useful resources. Haruka soon came across a river, refilling his water supply. He then found a cave, which he turned into a makeshift base. Using magic, he created a fire and realized his skills were leveling up. He gained abilities like fire magic, enemy detection, and clairvoyance. The next day, Haruka faced off against goblins. He used his magic-infused staff to fight them, defeating them with his growing powers. After his first battle, he reflected on his mental exhaustion, but was relieved to have survived. As days passed, he leveled up his skills and grew stronger, though he still had a lot to learn about this new world. At one point, he encountered some of his classmates in the forest, including the class delinquent, athletes, and the class representative. Although he recognized that having companions would be beneficial, he ultimately enjoyed the freedom of being alone. Haruka decided that, rather than join them, he would conquer this world on his own terms. At the moment when the criminals get too close to Haruka, he quickly dives into a nearby bush to hide. However, one of the criminals thinks they hear something in that direction and begins to approach cautiously. Haruka feels the pressure, but luckily, a rabbit hops out of the bush, convincing the criminal that it was nothing, and they all leave. Haruka follows them, noticing they settle near the river. Although he wants nothing to do with them, he feels the need to overhear their conversation. When he listens closely, he realizes they are merely gossiping about obscene things regarding the girls in their class. While it worries him, he reassures himself that the class representative will protect the girls. Suddenly, one of the criminals grabs another student, Tanaka. They want him to confirm if their abilities allow them to do anything they desire. Haruka recognizes Tanaka and realizes the criminals are using him as a living guide. He heads back to his new hideout, feeling both relieved and shocked to see that his solitude stat has leveled up. This makes him think it was because he avoided his classmates. He muses that if his patient stat had also leveled up after all his efforts, he might have gone crazy from the pressure. Haruka reflects on how these strange abilities are eroding his self-esteem, but he still remains at level 3. He also notices his Master of Nothing skill hasn't improved, which he figures is due to not fully understanding what it even does. He remodels his cave to make it more livable, pondering if his new skill makes him some sort of puppet master or just an idiot. By the seventh day around midnight, Haruka struggles to sleep because of noises coming from outside. Curiosity drives him into the forest, where he finds a group of nerds fighting goblins. 
Haruka wonders if he should help, but quickly uses his evaluation skill to see they don't need assistance, since their abilities are far superior to his own. He recalls that his class was full of elite athletes, genius students, and children of celebrities, so he often questioned how an ordinary boy like him ended up with them. Although the nerds seem capable, Haruka notices a few goblins about to ambush them. Without hesitation, he leaps out of hiding and defeats the goblins swiftly. The nerds, finishing their battle, finally notice Haruka and thank him for his help. Haruka, having forgotten how to hold a conversation, awkwardly leads them back to his cave. They are impressed by how luxurious it is, and Haruka asks what happened to the rest of the class. They recount that after everyone except Haruka was transported to the forest, the situation quickly descended into chaos. While the nerds kept calm and started investigating their stats, the delinquents pressured them for answers. The class representative tried to keep order, but goblins soon attacked, sending everyone into a panic. Although the nerds were able to fight off the goblins with their skills, the class began to fracture. Many students, especially the gals, a group of stylish girls, refused to help set up camp and eventually distanced themselves from the group. With the class in disarray, only a few, including the class representative and the nerds, continued working and defending the camp from more goblin attacks. Eventually, the delinquents chose sinister skills like charm and puppeteer, which allowed them to manipulate others. The nerds overheard their plan to create a harem and informed the class representative, who decided something had to be done. In a confrontation, the nerds managed to use their sealing abilities to neutralize the delinquents' powers, exposing their dark intentions. The delinquents were expelled from the camp, but returned later to wreak havoc, setting fire to the tents before leaving with a promise to return. Haruka feels sympathy for the nerds and proposes a feast to cheer them up, but they aren't too enthusiastic. The next day, the nerds decide to head downstream in search of a town to start their lives as adventurers. They invite Haruka to join them, reminding him of the books they used to share. But Haruka declines, feeling that his low stats would only hold them back. As he continues his journey, Haruka stumbles upon a kobold, which bites him before he defeats it. Following the trail of the camp, he soon comes across the gals. Nervous, he tries to sneak away, but they notice him and ask if he knows where the nerds are. Surprised by their change in demeanor, Haruka asks why they're looking for the nerds, suspecting they just want to exploit them again. However, the gals explain that they want to apologize, acknowledging that they're alive thanks to the nerds' help. Haruka, doubtful but intrigued, presses them to prove they're serious by showing they can survive and fight monsters on their own. When the gals break down crying, begging Haruka to teach them how to survive until they can reconcile with the nerds, something strange happens. Haruka's subjugation ability activates, and suddenly the gals are listed as his subordinates. Disturbed, he reluctantly leads them through the forest, all the while wondering how he ended up in such a situation. To make matters worse, the class representative suddenly appears behind him, catching him red-handed with the gals as his unwilling followers. Surprised, he called her President Sama, something she didn't like since they had known each other since elementary school. Shortly after, the other girls arrived, exhausted from trying to keep up with the president. The president asked Haruka about Shimasaki, the leader of the gals, and the others, as they seemed to be acting strange. Haruka hesitated, but eventually explained that he had somehow subdued all three of them. This alarmed the president, who questioned why he would use that power, which was meant for monsters. Haruka awkwardly explained that it just happened, causing the girls to give him intense looks. Haruka tried to leave, but the girls called him back, and the president asked why he was leaving. The president approached to check if Shimasaki was okay, and, when he took her hands and spoke to her, she regained her composure. Meanwhile, a calculation mistake left Haruka buried in the ground, and the president scolded him for not staying still. After rescuing Haruko, the president told him that Shimasaki and the gals mentioned he had come to help them all. Haruka didn't recall saying anything like that, but didn't correct the misunderstanding, so the president and the others thanked him. Haruka then asked if he could go home, which annoyed the girls, and the president asked what home he meant. Haruka explained that he had some free time and built a house, something the girls found extraordinary. The president blew a whistle to gather everyone and discuss something important. They asked Haruka about his house, and he explained it could fit over 200 people, fully equipped with furniture, a kitchen, bathroom, and showers. The president was shocked, wondering why he had such a nice mansion while they had been living in survival mode. Haruka also mentioned he was working on a guest room but kept that to himself. After talking, the girls convinced the president to ask Haruka if they could stay for one night. 
Haruka was surprised, but agreed, leading them to his house. When they arrived, the girls were amazed at the luxury. They were so focused on the shower that they couldn't resist jumping in. Haruka and the president tried to stop them, but it was too late. Haruka realized their time in the forest had made them wild. Later, he set up his tent outside, preferring his own space over staying with a group of high school girls. That night, the president thanked Haruka for saving her, saying she felt useless after Oda and his friends left. Haruka reassured her that she had always tried her best, and they shared a laugh, making her feel better. The next morning, one of the girls woke Haruka for breakfast. Still sleepy, he wondered who she was, even though he didn't have any sisters or neighbors. She confidently told him breakfast was grilled fish and mushrooms, which excited Haruka so much he bumped his head on hers. Despite the mishap, he enjoyed the meal. The girls decided they needed more training before heading to the city, and Haruka agreed to help. They soon faced a group of kobolds but were easily defeated. Haruka wasn't impressed, but the girls were determined to try again. After hard training, the girls successfully defeated the kobolds without injuries. They celebrated, even shaking hands with the confused monsters. Haruka was relieved, thinking he could return to his solitude, but the president told him they would go to the city together. Haruka was confused, but didn't argue. As they prepared to leave, packing mushrooms and fish, Haruka reminded the president to stay alert for danger. Meanwhile, a scene shows a student being killed by a hooded figure for not having a certain ability, with the figure pleased with their actions. Haruka and the girls continue their journey through the forest. He realizes that since criminals are after the girls, keeping the group safe is the top priority. To do that, they must leave the forest as soon as possible. Not long after, they encounter a giant orc. Haruka quickly tells the others to step back, wanting them to watch and learn a few things about fighting. When the orc launches its first attack, Haruka moves so fast that he disappears from its view. He mocks how slow the orcs are. From his hiding spot, he remembers that orcs are strong against physical attacks but weak against magic, something the otakus had told him. He checks his menu for magic and notices he has fire, earth, water, and wind magic. Except for fire, the others came from basic activities like digging and cleaning, which makes him realize that even seemingly useless skills can come in handy. The orc eventually spots Haruka, but he easily dodges every strike. Haruka sneaks behind it and strikes its neck with his staff, using so much force that the orc falls to the ground crying before slowly dying. Haruka is surprised, thinking orcs were supposed to be resistant to physical attacks. The girls give him sharp looks, so Haruka quickly goes after another orc and uses fire magic. The fireball causes a huge explosion, taking the orc down with ease. Once again, he's surprised by how effective his magic is, even though he expected it would take more power to defeat the monster. The girls complain that they can't learn anything because he's too strong. At night, Haruka sets traps with earth magic to protect them from approaching enemies. He then mentions that his tent can scare away bad guys and grants enhanced perception, which should be enough to keep the girls safe. Afterward, he checks the route for tomorrow using his map skill, gained from his villager set and special contact lenses. He appreciates how useful these skills are. Suddenly, his perception skill alerts him to nearby enemies. He sneaks over to investigate, only to find a group of athletes, led by Kakazaki. The two greet each other warmly, exchanging jokes as they talk. Koka, one of the girls, suspects that the athletes are after the girls, accusing them of being untrustworthy. Kakazaki explains that they actually came to find Haruka. Haruka jokingly suggests they have a boy-lover reason, which they quickly deny. On a more serious note, Haruka asks why they've been hiding from the girls. Kakazaki reveals that they can't trust anyone, reminding Haruka of a skill scarier than any puppet or charm abilities. Haruka guesses it's related to kidnapping, which Kakazaki confirms. The criminals haven't mentioned such a skill, which means someone unknown has it. Haruka jokes about what would happen if he had the kidnapping skill, causing momentary shock before the athletes relax, trusting that he'd use it wisely. This frustrates Haruka, who clarifies that he doesn't have it but has learned a skill called subjugate. Kakazaki explains that they wanted to warn him about the kidnapper and will continue to observe the criminals. Before leaving, they ask Haruka to pass on an apology to the girls, especially the president. The next day, Haruka notices the girls seem more cheerful. The president approaches him, asking for a private conversation. She brings up the encounter with Kakazaki from the night before. Haruka passes on Kakazaki's apology, but the president seems nervous. Haruka then hints that she might have the kidnapping skill, which surprises her. She asks how he knew, since it was supposed to be a secret between her and Oda. Haruka replies that he figured it out by simply looking at her and that the athletes are too clueless to realize it. The president asks why Haruka helped her even though he knew the truth, wondering if he's not afraid of her ability, 
which can steal skills by taking someone's life. Haruka, confused, tells her there's nothing to fear. He reminds her that the otaku sealed the puppeteer in charm skills but never hers because they trust her, and he does too. His words encourage the president, though Haruka quickly points out that she's been crying a lot lately. She blames him, saying it's because of his expressions. Haruka hastily runs away, claiming he hasn't done anything wrong, but the president smiles and thanks him, even though he's already gone. Later, Haruka tries to negotiate with the girls, offering to sell them juice. One of the girls tries to persuade him using questionable tactics, which leads to the president scolding him while the other girl is upset, as she just wanted some juice. As they resume their journey, Haruka tells the group he'll scout ahead. Before the president can say anything, he disappears, moving at incredible speed. Once alone, he immediately starts using his magic wrapping ability. Haruka then uses his weight magic to make himself lighter. Combining this with other skills, he becomes faster and lighter, allowing him to practically fly. He jumps high into the air, amazed by the stunning view, but soon realizes he's falling rapidly. With no way to stop himself, he crashes into the ground. Fortunately, his magic wrapping, which strengthens his body, prevents the fall from being fatal, though it leaves him with just a sliver of health. Despite the rough landing, he sees the path they need to take next. When he returns to the group, the president scolds him for getting hurt, but Haruka makes a few excuses without really explaining what happened. Instead, he changes the subject, offering her some berry juice. The president, still upset, walks away, while another girl happily tries to take the juice from his hands. The next day, they continue their journey through the forest. As they travel, various events unfold, and eventually, they exit the woods. Haruka checks his menu and notices that he has gained the airwalk skill, likely from his near-death experience. Without wasting any time, he tries out the skill, discovering that he can now walk on air. When the president notices, he reassures her that he's just making sure everything is safe. While scouting ahead, Haruka spots the first native inhabitants of this other world. The president rushes over and sees that it's a group of elders and people in armor, who are under attack. She suggests they help them, but Haruka hesitates, thinking they might not be good people just because they're being attacked by monsters. He warns the girls that they won't make it in time if they run, and asks what they'll do if the people turn out to be bandits. The president replies that if they're bad, they'll fight, but if they're not, she wants to help. Haruka knew she'd say that, so he tells the girls he'll handle it alone, and they agree to let him go. Haruka realizes running won't be fast enough, and even his magic wrapping and weight magic won't cut it. So, he decides to try something new. Using magic wrapping to enhance his physical abilities and weight magic to make himself lighter, he adds wind magic to propel himself through the air. With air walk, he flies at great speed. However, he soon notices that the president is clinging to him, clearly not feeling well. She explains that she got caught in his magic, and tells him to look ahead and stop, but Haruka warns her that humans aren't made to stop so quickly. They both end up crashing near the group they intended to save. The impact instantly defeats all the monsters attacking the group. Without realizing it, Haruka asks if everyone is okay, while the president remains unconscious. The leader of the group introduces himself as Ofter, and beside him is his friend, Gatek. Haruka is relieved that he can understand them without difficulty. They thank him for saving their group, but Haruka asks why they were being attacked. Ofter explains that merchants have been under attack recently, so the Adventurer's Guild issued a bounty to exterminate the threats. They thought it would be easy money, but would have been killed if not for Haruka. He adds that they didn't expect to encounter a large green wolf. Ofter orders his group to gather what's left of their belongings, as their carriage was overturned and their goods scattered. Haruka realizes there's not much to do until the girls arrive, and the president is still knocked out. He approaches Gatek and offers him some cooked mushrooms. After a bite, Gatek is amazed by the taste and surprised that they're resistance-boosting mushrooms, which he thinks are rare. Haruka is confused by this, unaware of the mushroom's rarity, but soon everyone else tries them and feels rejuvenated. Despite the pleasant atmosphere, Haruka is a bit annoyed that these older men are hanging out with the girls. Just then, the president wakes up and, seeing Haruka's suspicious behavior, tries to calm him down. Later, the girls finally catch up, and they immediately flock to the elf and Ofter's group, admiring her. Ofter and his group lead them to the city of Amui. The sight of the incredible city excites the girls, who try to run toward it, but Haruka holds them back. Once they calm down, he draws a long line in front of them, and they all stand together, holding hands. After a few moments, they jump over the line and cheer, celebrating their arrival with joy. Meanwhile, the criminals are preparing to track and attack the girls. One of them suggests to their leader, Sho Katsuyama, that they should first unlock their charm and puppeteer abilities. Sho agrees and decides to find the otakus, who have the sealing skill needed to undo the lock on his abilities. As they begin their search, the one who made the suggestion smirks mischievously, while the athletes observe from a distance, worried that the criminals are about to make their move. Without wasting more time, as soon as they enter the city, the girls eagerly begin to explore everything around them. The group leader thinks the city looks like a fun place, 
with plenty of people on the streets and a variety of shops everywhere. However, as the girls get more distracted, she tries to remind them they still have tasks to complete. To keep everyone together, she hurries to prevent them from wandering off, while Haruka, feeling relieved, watches over them, knowing his duty to safely escort them to the city is finally complete. After a while, the leader grows frustrated at her difficulty in keeping the girls organized and soon notices that Haruka is quietly resting after all his hard work. Annoyed, she scolds him for not offering to help. Her patience reaches its limit, and in response, she blows her whistle, summoning all the girls to form up. Haruka observes that they are well-trained, and the leader proceeds to brief everyone on the next steps. First, they need to head to the Adventurers Guild to sell everything they've gathered. After that, they'll register as adventurers and finally, they can rest at an inn. They also plan to inquire about Oda and the others while they're at the guild. Shimasaki complains that it feels like they're being treated as a secondary mission, prompting Haruka to tease her about worrying for their safety. Although Shimasaki denies it, she appears a bit less confident. Upon arriving at the guild, they sense a tense atmosphere inside as the men there don't seem welcoming, especially seeing a group with so many girls and just one boy. Just then, someone informs Haruka that someone wants to speak with him, so he heads upstairs, where he meets the guild master, a man with an intimidating presence who looks a lot like Myhawk. Although initially nervous, Haruka is relieved when the guild master thanks him for rescuing the group. Haruka leaves feeling reassured, then spots a room within the guild where resources are sold. He informs the receptionist that he wants to sell his magical crystals, and she asks him to place them on the counter. Haruka finds this unusual but proceeds to unload his pile of crystals, leaving the receptionist overwhelmed by the sheer quantity. She even hints that she won't be able to assess it all at once, and when Haruka offers to bring more, she asks him to give her at least a day to handle everything. At that moment, the girls return, excited to announce that they've registered as adventurers. Ofter feels pleased, knowing they are all level 30 and well-equipped for a dangerous job. Haruka notices that their levels have grown significantly on the journey, with abilities boosted from their time in the White Hall. Meanwhile, the previously unfriendly men in the guild are now surprisingly amicable with some of the girls. Shimasaki nudges Haruka to go register himself, and he begins to mentally bid farewell to his past self, ready for this new start as an adventurer. Once inside, the leader tells Ofter and Gatek that Haruka is bound to be a remarkable adventurer, noting that without his support, none of them would have made it this far. As the guild attendant reviews Haruka's stats, however, she informs him that he must be at least level 10 to register. This news disheartens Haruka, who asks if there might be a slight exception, but she firmly states that all adventurers must be level 10 or above and that those under level 20 are still considered beginners. Additionally, his solo player status means he won't be able to form groups, and he worries about being stuck at this beginner level indefinitely. The leader observes Haruka's frustration and realizes that, with him out of commission, it's up to her to take the girls to their lodgings. When they arrive, she explains that the guild arranged the accommodations. Haruka, finding the place unusual, asks the receptionist if it's a love hotel, leading to a scolding from the leader. Once everyone settles in their rooms, she finally feels at ease, comforted by the room's simple and pleasant feel, though she misses the forest. The next day, Haruka decides the girls should be safe in the city, so he thinks it's best to return to the forest after collecting the payment for his crystals. When he arrives at the reception desk, the receptionist apologetically hands him a bag of gold, explaining that it's all the money they have, hoping it's enough. Haruka finds her behavior strange, as it's not like he's pressuring her. The guild master approaches and explains that they haven't fully processed his loot yet and lack sufficient funds, so he offers a payment plan, which Haruka accepts. The guild master then hands over the gold, informing him it totals 8 million air. Initially, Haruka assumes the money has the same value as back home, but he soon realizes it's a substantial amount. The receptionist further explains that he earned the sum by gathering a large quantity of F-rank crystals, plus a reward for defeating the Green Wolves. Gatek then suggests a place that he thinks Haruka will enjoy, as a token of appreciation. Haruka, misunderstanding, assumes it's a brothel and eagerly follows Gatek, with the group leader trying to stop him, guessing exactly what he's thinking. They arrive at a little-known weapon shop, specializing in rare dungeon items. Haruka feels both amused and slightly disappointed, but soon grows excited as he tries out various weapons and unique armor pieces, finding it hard to resist any of them. During his browsing, he notices a special piece of jewelry with an adjusts to seven feature. His appraisal skill, now level five, has shown a similar phrase in the description of his villager A set, so he asks the shopkeeper what it means. The shopkeeper explains that it allows items to be combined, and with this necklace, he could combine up to seven items and use their effects simultaneously. Hearing this, Haruka gets an idea if his villager A set can do the same, he could add numerous effects to his gear. However, as he's absorbed in his thoughts, the leader arrives to scold him, reminding him that it's late and the girls are already asleep. Haruka insists on staying a bit longer, but in his excitement, he accidentally drops an item onto the pile he's accumulated, causing them to merge unexpectedly. The shopkeeper angrily shouts that merging items without buying them is forbidden, especially with a collection worth over 10 million air. Gatek and the leader try to negotiate a small discount, while Haruka sighs in dismay, realizing his shopping spree has come to an abrupt end. The following day marks 20 days since they arrived in this world, and Haruka appears noticeably downcast. They manage to negotiate the price down to 8 million air, 
but it has left them broke. Haruka wishes he could go out and gather more crystals, but foreigners aren't allowed to leave the city unless they become adventurers and obtain a permit. Although he considers sneaking out with the girls, he figures the leader wouldn't trust him enough to let him do so. Unwilling to give up, he puts on his old villager a cloak, which is now combined with a cloak of invisibility. Feeling confident, he believes even the leader won't be able to catch him this time. A short while later, Haruka sneaks toward the city exit, slipping past the girls and the leader within minutes. Seeing no guards at the entrance, he quickly jumps, ready to take off. Just then, a group of girls call out, asking where he's headed. Startled, Haruka loses focus and crashes hard into the wall. While recovering, he recognizes the group as the athletes, but notices one of them is missing. Looking ahead, he sees her, a girl with a habit of changing clothes wherever she pleases. Her name is Nagisa Fukuin Noi, and everyone rushes to her, as she's changing right outside the city. Haruka makes a comment that causes her to feel downhearted, so he quickly compliments her to lift her spirits. Although it works, he ends up feeling disappointed in himself, as his first escape attempt has failed. The next day, the girls prepare to leave for their first mission, and though Haruka tells the leader he'll stay behind, as soon as she's out of sight, he activates his invisibility and sneaks out of the city. Outside, he heads straight for the forest, ignoring everything along the way, including a carriage being attacked by bandits. Inside, a girl is calling for help, but as Haruka passes by, one of the bandits spots him, unwilling to let witnesses escape. Determined to reach the forest, Haruka uses a newly acquired item to hurl fireballs at the bandits, leaving them scorched. His wooden staff, enhanced with mistletoe vines, seems remarkably powerful, perhaps from an embedded fire attribute. As the bandits recover and attack again, Haruka repels them with more magical abilities. They accuse him of having a magical job class, and without thinking, he blurts out that he doesn't have one, a secret he'd intended to keep. This prompts the bandits to check, confirming he doesn't have a magic class and that he's only level 9. Gaining confidence, they begin using weapon skills, which Haruka can't yet employ since he needs to be at least level 20. Despite this, he dodges their ranged attacks until they're too exhausted to continue. From shouting skill names nonstop, the bandits are out of breath and eventually faint. The girl in the carriage, grateful for his help, introduces herself as Muriel, explaining that she's from a noble family. Haruka realizes they fainted more from self-exhaustion than from his intervention, so he's unsure what to say. Initially, he even tried to ignore her cries for help, so he feels undeserving of her gratitude. Meanwhile, Haruka thinks he's encountered another odd character in the strangest way. Muriel then asks for his name and, after introducing himself, she mentions she's the daughter of a lord from a nearby city. She requests that he accompany her for the rest of her journey, saying she feels unsafe and wants to show her gratitude. This last point convinces Haruka so he agrees to join her. Feeling more comfortable, Muriel asks him what he thinks of the city he departed from. Haruka begins criticizing the city's strange inns, the guild's insufficient payouts, and the rule preventing outsiders from leaving. He even remarks that the city's lord is likely as unimpressive as the city itself. Hearing this, Muriel grows uncomfortable, as she's the daughter of that very lord, and feels embarrassed by her family's reputation. Haruka then realizes that the carriage is heading to her city, Omyu, and he loudly asks to be let out. She declines, saying she wants to treat him well and prove that her city is far from substandard. Meanwhile, Haruka internally groans, knowing he's being dragged further from the forest yet again. Elsewhere, the athletes are blocking the path of some troublemakers, with Kakazaki declaring they won't let anyone near the girls. Katsumashiyu, the leader of the troublemakers, tries to attack Kakazaki for refusing to back down, but out of nowhere, someone drives a sword into Katsuma's back, turning the situation even uglier. As soon as the leader of the criminals is struck down, one of his allies rushes to attack the mysterious figure, but the stranger quickly counters and skillfully stabs him as well. Another attacker attempts the same, but the stranger disarms him with a slice of his blade. Before he can finish the job, the mysterious man uses telekinesis to summon a large sword once wielded by Katsuyama. In a swift motion, he takes down the two criminals who dared approach him. With the criminals defeated, the remaining athletes try to flee, but they're caught by the incredible speed of the assassin, who corners them. Finally, as he draws close, they get a glimpse of his true identity. Meanwhile, Haruka is still grumbling about not wanting to be taken to Omoi, while Muriel feels hurt by his constant complaints despite her attempts to make it up to him. After they finish their journey, Haruka arrives at her grand mansion, where she excuses herself, leaving him alone in the sitting room. After waiting a few minutes, he decides he'll just leave, but Mariel reappears, stopping him with a pout, reminding him she invited him as a thank you. She takes him to the dining room, where a grand feast awaits. She tells him she wanted to repay him for saving her life, although she wonders why she's so frustrated by his lack of gratitude. After the meal, she hands him a bag of gold and an identification card, having learned he didn't have one. She hopes this will make him remember the name of her village. But throughout, Haruka barely listens, focused only on the food and the rewards. Disheartened, she wonders if he'll ever truly pay attention to her. The next day, 
the president and some other girls interrogate Haruka, who explains he was invited to the mansion and wasn't sneaking out of the village. The president is convinced, but she's curious about what he did to earn such an invitation. Haruka can't answer, but just then, one of the girls tells them to get on with their missions. The president reminds Haruka he isn't allowed to leave the village, then leaves with the others. Alone, Haruka realizes there's nothing stopping him from going where he wants. Using the money he received from Mariel, he buys some supplies, choosing food without mushrooms, and writes a note for the president, explaining he's just checking on the athletes because he's genuinely concerned for them. At the village entrance, he shows his new ID to the guard, who lets him pass. Free to go, he heads straight for the forest, determined to ignore any trouble along the way. Soon after, he encounters an orc but takes it down easily with a quick blow from his staff. He finds it strange, as these creatures are usually deeper in the forest, but he's pleased that the tools he bought are proving useful. As he ventures further, he starts to feel something is wrong. Suddenly, he spots a large bloodstain on a rock. He doubts it's from the experts from Iskai, so it must be from the athletes he hasn't seen since they split up. He wonders why the criminals haven't left the forest either. Just then, his enemy detection skills pick up a trail of blood and footprints. Following it in haste, he begins to suspect the athletes may have confronted the criminals, a decision that he fears may have led to serious trouble. When Haruka arrives at the scene, he is shocked to find the athletes badly wounded on the ground. He quickly realizes that Kakazaki is still breathing, so he uses every healing potion he made, hoping they'll pull through. After a moment, Kakazaki regains consciousness, relieved to see Haruka, and immediately asks if the girls are safe. Haruka reassures him that they are, and adds that the athletes' efforts were a huge help to the class. Later, as the others wake up, they share details of what happened. They confirm that the criminals are dead and say everything happened so fast. However, they're unsure if the nerds are safe, as the assassin they encountered is incredibly powerful and managed to steal all their weapons from a strange white room. The group suspects this assassin may be a mathematical genius who planned the whole thing. They also realize that his next target is likely Tsuyuri, the class representative, because of her dangerous kidnapping skill, which allows her to steal abilities by killing others. Haruka is troubled, as he thought only he and the nerds knew about Tsuyuri's skill. Kakazaki explains that they discovered it because the assassin repeatedly asked about Tsuyuri's location, likely having picked up her trail somehow. The group believes the assassin attacked them to force them to seek Tsuyuri for help, hoping to follow them and find her himself. Determined, they decide to fight together when the assassin appears. Haruka, however, hesitates to get involved, wishing only to live in peace. Yet, he eventually agrees to help, clarifying that he'll fight alone. His friends initially protest but see his determination and agree. Haruka shares his plan. They should return to the city and apologize to Tsuyuri for underestimating her a comment that offends them but ultimately convinces them to leave. Once alone, Haruka prepares for the upcoming fight. Meanwhile, Tsuyuri and the girls are searching the city for him. Though reassured by a note he left, they focus on training and leveling up. Back in the forest, Haruka reflects on the powerful weapon abilities he learned from the athletes. He knows they're potent but can leave the user vulnerable. He starts brainstorming a strategy to exploit this weakness. As he prepares, goblins, attracted by the scent of blood, begin to gather. Haruka notices their high level, as these types of monsters are typically found deeper in the forest. He uses this as a training opportunity, defeating several goblins without gaining a level but wishing he could face something stronger. Soon, a goblin king appears and charges him. Haruka skillfully dodges its attacks using an evasion skill, enhanced by his earlier preparation. After evading a few attacks, he notes that the goblin king has strong weapon abilities, perfect for testing his new strategy. He combines a series of skills using magical wrapping, imbuing this enhanced technique into his staff. With one swift strike, he defeats the level 23 Goblin King instantly. Pleased with the result, he reflects on how even weak abilities can be powerful when combined creatively. Just then, another monster appears behind him. Haruka's blood sense skill kicks in just in time, allowing him to sense the approaching danger and move away. He turns to see a level 50 Goblin Emperor, a much stronger foe than his level 9 self. Knowing he can't defeat it head-on but also unable to flee, Haruka decides to try combining his weaker skills into a new, original technique. As he does so, he realizes he's learning to create and master these new abilities on the fly. Prepared, he engages the Goblin Emperor, landing a blow with his new skill, but it barely leaves a scratch. The Goblin retaliates with fierce claw attacks, 
showing off its impressive speed and weapon skills. Seizing an opening, Haruka strikes hard, managing to knock the creature back and deal significant damage. However, the Goblin Emperor quickly heals itself and launches a powerful ranged attack, forcing Haruka back into the trees. Despite the grave situation, Haruka finds the strength to press on, comparing his injuries to the athletes. He's still in fighting shape. Their intense battle continues all night, and by dawn, Haruka finally defeats the Goblin Emperor, gaining two levels in the process and reaching level 11. Back home, he checks his stats and sees he's gained new abilities. He also understands his jack-of-all-trades skill. Though it slows his level progression, it grants him easier access to abilities and faster skill mastery. He still has a long way to go, but his new skill now allows him to exploit the vulnerability left by others' weapon skills, enabling him to attack swiftly with minimal setup. As he steps outside, a familiar figure appears, a hooded man who reveals himself to be Tanaka, a student the criminals once used to gather information. Haruka recognizes him as the one who collaborated with the criminals. Tanaka, however, appears unfazed, confident as he faces Haruka. Meanwhile, the girls return to the village, having leveled up, and spot the athletes in poor condition. Sayuri feels disheartened when she realizes Haruka isn't with them. Kakazaki informs her that Haruka is fighting alone in the forest. Back with Haruka, Tanaka explains that he had hoped the injured athletes would lead him to the president and never expected Haruka would come to this dangerous place instead. He admits it's embarrassing to be tricked by meatheads after all the effort he put into deceiving and manipulating the criminals. Haruka asks if Tanaka planned all of this, and Tanaka confirms it, revealing that he orchestrated everything to divide the class. This revelation enrages Haruka, who demands to know what happened to the others. Tanaka dismissively tells him they're all dead, and he has no interest in wasting time with someone who only has weak skills. But Haruka raises his staff, signaling that he won't let Tanaka proceed. Tanaka mocks him, asking why a lone wolf would interfere. Haruka firmly responds that even a loner has people he wants to protect. Tanaka warns him that if he stands in his way, he too will die.